What's up, everyone? Welcome to Mom's Basement MMA. And in this episode, I have one of my friends on this show. His name's Zach Kaufman. He is the creator of the Four Ounces to Freedom MMA podcast. He also writes for a variety of other various MMA publications. And he joins me right now to talk about MMA. Zach, welcome to the program. Thank you for doing this. I gave you like two minutes. And I didn't even really invite you. I just said, hey, you're coming on my show in like five minutes. And you were nice enough to say yes. Yeah. Uh, open availability. Have about... <laughs> Almost an hour worth of time, so we'll crush whatever we can in the time frame. In the amount of time that I've known you, you're one of the few people that I've met where I can just like have a fluent conversation with about regional MMA. And amongst our world, amongst our cohort, shall we say, that's kind of a rarity. Like I feel like it's UFC or bust. And I got into regional MMA really because I just sensed a lot of opportunity there when I first started up my channel. And I was hoping you could tell me a little bit more about your background. I already know the answers, but for people who don't know you, how did you make regional MMA such a big primary focus on the four ounces to freedom podcast? Yeah. So I'll actually go even deeper. Cause I know, you know, the basis, like, you know, the, you know, the, the, the general story. Um, I've always been one to kind of like prefer the smaller guys. Um, no, did he? Um, even back in the day, I was in the like the local music scene. I didn't care about like I lived near Philly. I could hop on a train and be in Philly to any concert in 15, 25 minutes. I didn't care. I'd rather go pay ten dollars and watch a friend play a shitty cover song. And that's kind of where it came into it. You know, did that on the music scene? Did that in the re the pro wrestling scene? Yeah, it was cool watching WWE and all that. But it was cool to see like again my friend in the ring at a twenty five dollar local show. Um, you get into like you know UFC. And it wasn't. It was actually even before it got kind of repetitive on booking and kind of like lower quality in a way. You started seeing them kind of mention like, "Oh, this guy was like an LFA champion. This guy was a CFC champion. This champion. This champion." And I was like, "Well, what? What are these? And like, why am I not watching these? Because like, everyone's hunger is stronger before they get to the big show. And we've seen it. We've seen people who have looked like superstars in the regional scene. They make it bigger and they suck. Uh, be it you know." level of competition they were given on the on the regional scene and all that. So started getting real into there. Um, again, lucky enough being in Pennsylvania, we do have a variety. We have, um, you know, the biggest time at the time was CFC. They are kind of still the biggest NPA. Uh, Art of War is starting to really grow a little footprint too. 24-7 Maverick MMA. Um, we At one time we had like a Rage in the Cage. Um, we had a bunch of, you know, just like all other regional shows. We've had a bunch that come through that are, they lasted a couple of years and now they're gone. I mean, Dave Feldman used to run shows in Philly and that's gone. So it was more so just like re rinse and repeat from music, wrestling, regional, and uh, being a gambler too, it always helped too because I get to see these guys ahead of time and um, it's been fun. The podcast is relatively new and in a short amount of time, like particularly like these past like six months or so, like I feel like you've built up like a lot of momentum. A lot more people are tuning into your show. Can you kind of tell me like from when you first started, I think it was roughly a year and a half ago to today, like what's that journey been like? What have been some of the biggest things and what are some of your uh, pointers that you would have for new people looking to get into doing what we do? Yeah. I think I set everything up about like December 30th, 2022. Um, I think the first episode drop was maybe like the first week of january 2023 and that was actually with like aaron lafarge there's all people who like i was already talking to and i was like hey like i'm starting this i don't know where it's gonna go do you mind hopping on a, a, a call and like i even hopped on these calls with like no questions i was like i can do this and then you start realizing like it's a lot harder than people think too like you can ask the general question like what got you into the sport what do you plan on do do you want to be in the ufc and anyone who says, like, no to that, like, they're lying. They want to be on the next level. And then from there, you know, you kind of like, start blossoming. Uh, at the time, I was really, you know, I was at every CFC local, like, Philly show, eventually the New Jersey show. So I got to know people already from the fights. So it was actually easy to even get guests on. Um, from there, as far as, like, the initial growth, it came from, like, you know, keeping an eye on what was going on. Um, I think it was, like, last February, last March, um, Richie Lewis and Eddie Torres had a little like beef at a Fury grappling event. I think they were my third and fourth guest because like, I was like, Oh shit, like this is going big. Like I, I anyone with common sense, that would have been the next fight to book. It was offered. It was offered. It was offered. Things happen. Um, 
fighters were offered to fight elsewhere and things just never came into the browse. But, you know, you put those two together and you start, you know, you had Fight Pass kind of pushing it and then I was just there at the right time. So that was the first burst. Um, then you mix in their two fan bases too. And from there, it's always been kind of just kind of keep an eye of like, who's the hot topic at that point without going like, who's the hot topic that everyone cares about? I did kind of wing the first year. It was kind of just like, a mix of people who I've seen on CFFC cards or have fought for CFFC and now are fighting for Fury or LFA. Um, and then it, about the end of last year, I was like, no, you know, I didn't want to keep putting all my eggs in a basket per se and stay with one promotion. Um, I think you actually even mentioned to me, like, hey, like, it's it's the ease, ease and flows of the sport. Like, so, sometimes, like, you know, behind you, you have an LFA glove. I have a CFFC poster behind me, like, there's times LFA is number one. Then there's the CFC, CFC will come and take number one. Then Fury will come out and do like 13 shows in 12 weeks. You know, it was kind of sitting there. So I started expanding a little bit, really broad. And then I actually, blessing and a curse, I was actually laid off December 31st of last year. So like starting this year, like it was like gun ho. Like I need to make something out of this channel like now. And I think in January, I interviewed, it felt like 30 people in two weeks, which is actually. Uh, helpful in a way um uh, definitely overkill that became a, a topic because i actually talked with like um, a relatively known person in the background who has like mentored like michael bisbing and a few other youtube channels of like how to actually grow your channel and i was like dude like, i don't know what i'm doing i just need i need to make it to the next level and he kind of pointed out like i think at one point i was doing like one interview a week he's like you need two to three i took two to three I was like i'm gonna do five and like that's if you don't have a job and you actually are making money with this, you can do five to five a week. If you have a job or any lifestyle, you cannot do five a week. Um, it's basically, unless you're just exporting and uploading, like I, I go through, I, I put, you know, the graphics, I kind of like build out scenes a little bit. I do my own uh, artwork. I put it up as a podcast instead of just a video. Like I, I hit every realm. I mean, and I know what works and doesn't work. Like I know some of my tactics are just worthless, but it's just like I see five people watching it in a certain area, so I put it there. Um, so, and to answer your your last question, like how you know the tips, don't go to UFC right away. Like we are in a sport that is totally accessible. You can message UFC fighters today and get an answer. You can't message an NFL player. You can't message an MLB player. Again, like right place, right time. Like I had a like, uh, Sudik Dumas as like one of my like first 10 interviews. And that was like at the time where like, you know, he was getting hated because like he, he told one podcast, like, give me a hundred dollars. I'll do the interview. And like, I reached out and like, Hey, I'm not paying you, but if you ever want to do an interview, let's do it. And like, he kind of explained a little bit. He's like, no, these kinds of, you guys are kind of dicks. And we're like Friday night at like 6 PM. I need you for an hour and a half. And I was like, no, dude, I need you for like 10 minutes. Like, we'll talk about the fight. We'll talk about you. You know, put the little thing together. We'll get it out there. Um, that's like you know, that was a wake up call too, because like I was already treating everyone respectful. And that's probably another step too. Is like, don't go to UFC level, and understand these people. Like most regional fighters have day jobs. Most of them are working nights. Like even worse, like they're working overnight, going home, sleeping, going to the gym for like an hour or two, going home, sleeping, coming back for another hour or two, sleeping, and going to work. Um, so always be respectful for your time and remember. Especially if you if you're not training, like this is my day job right here as well. So like I'm not at the gym. I'm not getting punched in the face. Like I can work around your schedule a little bit too, and um, it goes a long way too. And it, uh, more importantly, like care. Not everyone wins a fight. You know when someone loses, like give them a little bit of time, but then make sure you still stay in contact. And I don't stay in contact just to keep that contact. Like if you don't care, don't don't, don't bother them. There, I've had, you know, we, we've all had friends and, you know, just co connections who have, like, have gone to a fight, you know, even at a regional level or, you know, contender series, UFC and so on. And, like, it goes a long way to be like, dude, like, you looked great at this. But, you know, keep look at this. Like, you'll see. You, tell me if you see what I see as a fan. And uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's all about building connections as well. Like, so three-step three, three step program, don't do UFC. Start at your local uh, at promotion build a connection, and then, you know, give a damn. Zach, in private, a lot of times you and I talk a lot about the MMA, the state of MMA media and how it's changed a lot over the years. And now we're starting to see a confluence of a few different things, right? We're starting to see the a mixture of, like, traditional media, like your coat and tie, 
traditional media people that we remember like when we were growing up and now we're starting to see this wave of like influencers like Nina drama, et cetera, enter our world, enter the MMA space. And then YouTubers like my, like the two of us. Right. And so we're kind of like in this like weird gray area where we kind of have a foot in both camps. But in your opinion, like when you look at like how MMA media is covered, like give me your reactions to some of this. Cause we're starting to see a lot of headlines. We're starting to see a lot of other media personalities, YouTubers like me and you, like this seems to be a theme. We keep talking about this more and more. And there, I feel like there are two schools of thought. Number one is the UFC likes the whole influencer new wave sort of thing. And they're kind of encouraging people like crazy branding chick to go out and say crazy things. And, um, you, we're starting to see reporters catch, you know, Derek Lewis's nut cup and then ask Dana White to sign it. And, you know, we're starting to get people like James Lynch that are like asking, like, look, is this the right thing to do? What's your reaction to all this? And to give me your opinion on it. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of weird um, on, on all, all aspects. Like, if this was the way, I mean, I, you, you can't say like 30 years ago, if this was the way things started, it'd be different. Um, I mean, I think it is kind of weird to have like two men or, you know, and now women fighting in a cage and then having like the media in a suit and tie. Like it, it doesn't really go together. And that's one of the reasons why, like, you know, I never had any interest in that because like, I'm not a suit and tie person. Like, let me just wear my jeans and all that. And, you know, we can fake it till we make it. Um, and in a way I'm happy there that it at least seems like, you know, I could be that guy now who covers an event because like nothing fucking matters anymore. Um, on the other hand, like, I also get the UFC standpoint. When you look at the numbers, like, MMA Guru, Lucas Tracy, and the like, so everyone else that's in that category, they're beating, like, MMA Junkie, MMA Fighting. Um, I think the only one they really had competition with is, like, MacLife, which is crazy because MacLife's, like, just Oscar Willis. So, like, if these YouTube guys who are just... You know, some have never even been to an event ever in their life are beating these numbers. Like, why wouldn't you want those people at your event? Uh, because, you know, if they were to come and cover it and put it to their channel, you're just going to get the, the larger echo. Um, on the other hand, like, the same people who have those numbers are the ones that are bashing fighters and um, <laughs> grabbing used cups from the ground from the fight and asking me brand it by a retired UFC fighter just for clout, not even for like personal reasons, just literally they, because they know it's going to get talked about. Um, so I, I get both sides. I'm, st I'm kind of in the middle. Like I, I would be cool with it kind of opening up a little more. Um, we are going to change into the guard where we all have a phone in our pocket that's connected to the world 24 seven. Um, it's very rare that I think anyone's phone dies nowadays because like we use it as a lifeline. Uh, but also like even like all, I think I actually ran on a rant this morning because apparently my first idea in the morning is just a bitch. Um, even about media, like watching like the um, the media from last night's pay per view UFC three hundred two, like ninety five percent of it was pointless. Um, every question is the same. doesn't matter who gets the first question. It could be John Morgan. It could be Oscar Willis. It could be Jose Young's. Like the first question is always like, what are your feelings about this fight? Who do you want to fight next? Was there anything that, that, that caught you off guard in this fight? Some stupid question about some stupid call out they made, like something that happened that week that was like, why did that happen? And then you have like, you know, the newer media guys who come in and kind of like ask the same thing rephrased. So it sounds better because it's it's not the same script, but it's the same question. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, watching it, it's like one of those things like, did I need to fly to New Jersey to ask that? Like, couldn't that be asked like on a, a Zoom call? Like, um, outside of that, you know, the coverage of the, like, the media week, everyone's uploading the same content. No one's really doing anything special because the UFC has these fighters booked all day anyway, so it's not like you can really do a lot of your own original content. Um, you know, maybe maybe you get a fighter or two, or you maybe you know a corner or two to come out and you know, do like an in person interview that gives you a little more insight than the next guy. Um, outside of that, you know, at that point, maybe I'm cool with like the the YouTube generation kind of taking over uh, because you know they're willing to kind of go the extra mile, uh, and it's blessing and a curse because like they're taking over in a fanboyism way 
Um, they kind of care more about like hearing their name instead of like getting the fighter story. Um, like that's cool. Like, I mean, I, I've done almost 80 interviews myself and like I had one fighter who like, in his thanks, it's like his sponsors are himself. Like he thanked me and said to subscribe to me. And I was like, no dude, like we don't do this. Like this is your interview. Like I can, I can promote myself on the side. Like I'm here to tell you the fighter story. And that's kind of where I would love to see a mix of like the content creators who actually care about the fighter story. Um, but to, even to do that, like by the time they're in the UFC, like the story is already kind of half written. Like I want the same, the same energy to go from these guys who want to like hit up like Tawny from PFL to go see a PFL show to like hit up a, a Rob Haydack at a CFC show or an Ed Soros at a, an LFA show. Like do the same energy and go get the local guys before they're the next big thing. Because turns out when they make it to the next stage, they remember you. I feel like the landscape of MMA has been changing quite a bit, especially over the past uh, year or so. Right? We had the Bellator PFL merger that has had that has created like shockwaves throughout the regional MMA scene. Now we have Invicta maybe being revived and coming back into the fold as well. When you look and you think about all of these things that are happening, I'm curious. Number one. The Bellator PFL merger, is that a good or bad thing for regional MMA? And then number two, as far as the state of women's mixed martial arts, where do you see the future of that happening? Where do you see it going beyond the uh, outside of the UFC level? Like when you're talking about that more developmental level, just with the status quo of everything, um, what are your thoughts about all that stuff? Yeah, so I mean, as far as like MMA as a whole, um, there is definitely, it's everything falls back to pro wrestling. Everything in MMA is pro wrestling. People just refuse to accept it. Um, we are in a territorial system where I can tell you if someone's fighting in a certain region, if they're actually getting a real matchup. Um, they might do the, some of the best shows, but if they're fighting in Massachusetts, the fight sucks. They're not going to benefit from it. Um, if they're fighting in like, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, who's the A side? That's gonna give me a big deal, of like who you know what the what the goal of that fight is. Um, LFA, if they're fighting a Brazilian, like everyone has their little like gimmick in a way. As far as that, you know, I think it's everyone in the regionals kind of wants to be the UFC without being the UFC. Campbell uh, McLaren, who uh, runs Com Combati Global, he says that he he doesn't watch anything besides Combati, which is like I I don't believe it. Um, but looking at and knowing people in a lot of like regional MMA, I know a lot of these guys do that. They only watch their product. And it's interesting because like outside of all that, like I think the only ones who can watch their own product and be okay is cage Titans. And it's because like, they don't run a show like once a month and they actually have a full like marketing team and they're ran by a, a former fighter and so on. So it's one of those things where like, we're at a, a stale state of the regional MMA and to kind of bring it all fourfold. It is also part of like the Bellator acquisition because like at one point you had UFC Bellator or PFL for a fighter to go to um, on paper. It was like, all right, cool. Like if this is ranked correctly, like they, they'll still have Bellator and PFL to go to, but the team at PFL, and this is where my potential credential never gets activated now is ran by two people who don't know what the hell they're doing. Um, they're the, it, This is what happens. When you have two venture capitalists buy a new set of toys and realize they bought too many. Um, and now since they kind of just killed off another like comp competitor, they can't even yard sale it. They can't sell a gig art Masasi, Masasi to a, a Bellator because you own them. And at his age, you, you're not going to sell him to a UFC. You're not going to sell him to a one, maybe Ryzen, but Ryzen's not going to pay UFC it, what his price was just to use him for two fights. Um, and we've seen it, you know, if he watches it, he'll know what, what, who I'm talking about. But like we, we've seen fighters who have been on the verge of one promotion and it holds out because, you know, they're hearing talks of another promotion or even maybe the original promotion is telling, no, no, these guys are calling you soon. So they hold back and so on. And now it's to the point where like you have to take anything that calls in now. And 
you combine that now with the the bottle next to like multi fight deals in regional MMA, which is one thing to like at, a multi fight. Re- like, I get it from the promotion side point too. That means they want to invest money in you. They want you to grow uh, because when you get signed, they get a kick a semi kickback, but they also can say we made that guy. But a lot of the fight pass promotions now also have a in their contracts where like you can only go to UFC. And again, that's where the antitrust was supposed to come into play and make everything better. And, you know, maybe at that point may, could have even fixed the Bellator PFL merger. Uh, but instead, the fighters just get screwed in the long run. Um, and as far as that, you know, hitting that Invicta, I really appreciate the fact that uh, I've been an Invicta fan for as long as I can remember. I think I actually, I think I watched like Invicta 6 as my first show. Um, I think that may have been the one with Rose Namajunas' uh, flying armbar. It was like her second pro fight. Um, and from there, I was like, oh, man, like this is smart. Like Women's MMA has, has never expanded outside of the growing stage. Yes, we've had a Ronda. We've had a, the Cyborgs. We've had the Nunezes with the, the Bullet of Suchenkos and all that. But it's always been six names eight names, and then the others. Um, whereas like, with Invicta's news earlier this week, like everyone seemed to be happy. And these are the same people who like cry when there's like a women's MMA fight on a pay-per-view. And I'm like, no, you guys get it. Like you guys realize that like, we have gotten these like terrible fights because we don't have an Invicta anymore. You know, we have promotions trying. Like Miranda over at CFFC has like, she's putting the effort in to grow it. But like without Invicta being able to go all in on female, you know, women's MMA, there is no, like, they're stragglers. Like, there's a reason why Invicta just signed um, Romero, because, like, them having her under that home plate now, she maybe, maybe she'll have more options than if she stayed with a CFC. That's nothing, that's not even me trying to knock that, the promotion, it's just the fact that if you're an all-female organization, that's eight fights that are all-female, not mm-hmm. two on a card or... You know, maybe you get one showcase fight with a with you know an Ami or a pro women's fight. Um, so I think we're better off there. And I think we also need to see more of that with um like different weight classes too. Like I think like LFA and like A1, they're pretty good with like building at the flyweights right now. Um CFC actually has probably one of the best flyweights right now too. They have like you know, Max Canonas, um Israel Galvan, uh Immortal Lotus, who's between them and like uh APFC. Like there's growth there. For a, a a weight class that Dana White has openly said he doesn't care about, and then it comes back, and then it, you know we hit the ease and flows there too. So I think like we all we we need all the regionals as a whole, but we also need these like specific ones like Invicta who can grow a niche portion of the market. Um, I am hopeful that you know since I think we can officially say the women's featherweights are gone from UFC, um, maybe. They start looking into like a women's atom weight because I think we actually have a lot of uh, 115ers who could be 105ers. Um, I know like, off the top of my head, like I know for a fact, um, like Elise Reed, like she could go, she could probably go 105 if at her, she is, you know, a little more retro now, if she could still make 105. Um, but they usually have a lot of 115ers who like they're not cutting weight to make it. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to say, you know, kill yourself and cut the extra 10 pounds, but like, you're going to fight better fights if you're like cutting to then fight at your natural weight. Um, so yeah, I mean, as, as a whole, I think we just, we also need to see a lot more regionals work together. Um, I mean, at one point we had like, the fight pass invitational, which like, now seems a jo- like a joke where at one point it was like all the fight pass promotions grappling against each other. Um, why not expand that to like fights? Like, and, you know, in the Northeast region, we'll see like ring of combat champions come in the CFC. But why not have like the CFC champ go fight the LFA champ? Like you do like a night of champions, like you run it like on uh, New Year's Day or something like that, and you have like, hey, we're gonna have the Fury Flyaway champion versus the CFFC Flyaway champion, and you know, like put on like you can make like a super fight card, and you do it once a year, and I, I put you run it on New Year's Day, dude. I'd love that. Yeah, I mean, like it's gonna suck with like a, your multi fight contracts and all that, right. but you know damn well if the guy who wins the title, he's not staying regional anyway. He's getting signed anyway, right? So right. like, why not like, put the big show on? Um, and it can also it can also kill this like fakeness of like we had the best roster. 
Do you? Like, prove it. <laughs> yeah, do you? Let's see. Like, you know, like, right now, like, I, I think, you know, I'm biased because, like, you know, I built a built connection and friendship with the guy, but, like, at the lightweight division right now, I would put, like, Marquez Forrest against, like, any lightweight champion right now. And if he loses, he learns. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, heavyweight champions, light heavyweight champions, because, like, you know, right now, like, you know, again, sticking with the local guys, too, again, like, Luke Fernandez, if he fought, like, a light heavyweight champion from LFA or anywhere else, that's going to be a, kind of the better competition than what he's getting lately. Yeah. Like, and it just opened up the doors because at that point, like, we already know, like, regional gets hit third quarter every year because contender, you know, you're not going to take a fight if you can be on contender series and then you don't get invited and you just sit, then you just sat yourself for three, four months. Right. Um, yeah. It's a lot of things there. I think we need to see more cross promotion because of the fact, especially with like, UFC building out contender series because that's three, four months of prep that takes away basically half a year of original MMA anyway. Absolutely. Well, Zach, I really appreciate our conversation today, but before we go, I'm going to ask you a few rapid fire questions, a few questions where I'm going to throw out headline fights your way. And I just want you to tell me who's going to be winning these fights, starting with next week, Cannoneer versus Mamov. Who are you taking? I'm going Cannoneer. All right. Um, this is the guy who like, does not age. I think he. Like, I don't want to say. I don't want to say my guess of his age because I know I'm gonna be wrong. But I think he's like in his near near forty. I think he is forty. And like he fights like a thirty five year old. Yeah. Like, like even maybe maybe even closer to thirty. And um, I just think you know this guy has. What does he have to do to get another title shot? Like he's done everything. He's done the bullshit backup way in. He's fought everyone they all heard. Um, I I want to see him get a win here and then. Uh, I don't. I don't want to say do a rematch with Sean because I don't want to see a jab fest again. Um, but maybe he's next in line for winner of DDP Izzy whenever that happens. Perez versus Tyra. I think Tyra. Um, if Perez wins, I wouldn't be shocked, but I would lean Tyra on that one. Whitaker versus Shemaev. I would love to see Whitaker win. Um, I mean, all Whitaker really has to do is last a round, round and a half. Um, because we all know, like, Shemaya's going to come out gun ho And um, I, I don't think Robbie's ever been brunt force tested yet. But if he can get through that, I mean, I think he can even counter the takedowns. And, got you know, God forbid he's the first one to knock out Shemaya. McGregor versus Chandler. Chandler. Nama Yunus versus Barber. So this is a fight that actually um it's so biased on my pick. Um so I'm I'm all on Thug Rose on that one. But I think this is like this is a fight to make, and I'm surprised Macy took it. Further down the list here, UFC three oh four Edwards versus Muhammad two. Uh, Muhammad by decision. Sanhagen versus Nirmaga Madov. That's another one. Like, I would love to see Corey win. I think Corey's the better fighter, the more uh, the more well rounded fighter. But I think Umar wins. Well, there you go. Those are all of the announced main events to date. We gave you all of the main event winners from here through August. So thank you, Zach. And you know, well, maybe we'll thank you. Maybe we'll hate you. I don't know. We'll have to go back and see how you did at the end of the summer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Zach, I appreciate your time. I know that you got other things going on today, so thank you. And before I let you go, uh, if there's anyone you want to thank or shout out, uh, let's do it. Yeah, um, changing pivots a little bit on the channel in the next couple weeks. Um, as you kind of hinted, Invicta is back. Um, so far, I do have two interviews scheduled with um, two of the women out of Scorpion Fight Team or Sc Scorpion Striking Team. I'll eventually get that right, and I better get it right before I interview them. Um, great team out of Ohio, I believe, if not Ohio, Michigan. One of those is correct. Michigan. Um, ran into them uh, a couple, uh, actually, I think a year or two ago because um, they were looking for a fight, and they all hopped into a van and drove out to Philly for an Art of War show. I think they all went um, undefeated that night, too. And I was like, oh, these guys, you know, I like the fact that they're willing to leave their territory to go fight somewhere else on like, a week's notice. Uh, so I have two girls from there. Uh, I think they're both pro debuts, if I recall. Um, and then I uh, should have an interview with Shannon Knapp 
uh, president of Invicta as well, because um, kind of how I hinted at earlier, like stay on top of things. Like when you hear like Invicta's coming back, like try to get fighters from that card. And if you can, like I, I, I've had some interaction with Shannon Pryor. So I reached out, I was like, Hey, I would love to talk to you about the return. Um, and right away, because like, you know, we, we, we interacted on the not so best terms. We handled it like adults. Um, we didn't copyright each other or yell at each other or any of that. And um, she was like, yeah, definitely. She was like, I love it. We will hop on there. So like, I'm, I'm kind of going uh, all in on Invicta. And then uh, as far as thanks, you know, everyone that watches, I don't know why the fuck you watch, but um, you know, the views they, keep getting better. They and, watch because uh, you're good at what you do. We, we can lie to each other. Yeah, it works. <laughs> but yeah, that's about it. Zach, I appreciate it. And I won't thank uh, you either, by the way. Yeah, I, I deserve like no thanks whatsoever. You know, I, I don't. But Zach, appreciate the time. And I look forward to uh, doing this again real soon, man. Awesome. Appreciate it.